I'm Deborah Castro, and I'm President and CEO of Creative Productions, and we're an award-winning integrated marketing and media agency, and we uh, service the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. I'm also a proud Price alum. Yay! <laughs> and a Price parent and current chair of the Leadership Council for the USC Price Athenian Society. And we're the sponsors here tonight of this event. The Athenian Society is the premier philanthropic support organization for the Saul Price School of Public Policy. And Athenian Society members are committed to the mission of the Price School, which is to improve the quality of life for people and communities here and abroad. And what I love most about the Athenian Society is, is really our impact um, with the events that we produce, like the ones that we have tonight, that are truly thought-provoking, where we bring in policymakers, practitioners, um, industry leaders, and community stakeholders that bring together diverse points of view and really encourage a dialogue. And I think that's what we're most looking forward to tonight um, so that we can do some deeper thinking about some of these really pressing issues that we like to look at. Um, in addition, we have had policy breakfasts um, recently, and they have been extremely well received. So please check your email. I know we all get a lot of it, but they're very worth attending, and I highly encourage you to come. Um, we've had some speakers, for example, I just wanted to give you a couple ideas of the kinds of events that we put on. We've had women in leadership, which we're extremely proud of. We've had leaders from the state of California, from the Federal Reserve. We've had uh, representatives from the city and the county of Los Angeles. And people have just really responded well to all the different types of programming that we have because we really have something for everyone. So on your seats, you will find some information about the Athenian Society, and we would love for you to talk to any of us or me um, about becoming a member, and I really hope you'll consider joining us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jack Knott, the Dean of the Saul Price School of Public Policy, who holds the C. Irwin and Ioni L. Piper Chair. He has led the school in this role since 2005, and Dean Knott is a leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy, and is past president of NATSPA, the International Association of Schools of Public Affairs. Under Dean Knott's leadership, the Price School has experienced significant growth and has strengthened its position as a leader in public affairs research and education. In addition to several major gifts, he was instrumental in securing the school's $50 million endowment and naming gift from the Price Philanthropies in 2011. Dean Knott also has uh, shepherded Price School's steady ascent in U.S. News and World Report rankings, moving us up from number seven in 2008 to number four in 2016 among public affairs schools nationwide. Please join me in welcoming Dean Jack Knott. It's wonderful that so many of you can join us this evening here at Town & Gown. Uh, as we continue our Price School focus on the issue of uh, human rights. We are very pleased to host this special conversation feature featuring Julia Ormond, Ambassador Louis DeBaca, Flor Molina, along with our moderator, Dr. Cherry Short, who will each share their unique expertise on what changes must be made to end human trafficking in Los Angeles, California, the country, and it's also a really important global problem. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have people sponsor these events, and so I want to list them. And when I'm finishing list them, I'd like to give a rousing uh, round of applause for their sponsorship uh, for such a high quality event. It's Budget Watchdogs, Capital Strategies Group, Creative Productions, Grassroots Lab, Regatta Solutions to Soro, and WSPA, the Western States Petroleum Association. Could you please give them a round of applause for their support? As Debbie mentioned, uh, the Price School is dedicated to promoting and developing 
innovative policy solutions to some of the most port important issues facing our society. Our school fosters pathbreaking scholarship that influences academic fields, but also informs policymakers. We inspire students to become change makers and problem solvers to help shape our world for the better. And we are committed to making an impact through engagement with our communities, such as with this Dean Speaker series. Tonight's conversation, titled Ending Trafficking, a Discussion on Human Rights, gives us the opportunity to place a much needed spotlight on one of the most pressing and prevalent issues facing the world today. According to UNICEF USA, an estimated 21 million people around the world are trafficked, with $32 billion in estimated profits generating by trafficking worldwide. Now, just take a moment to let those figures sink in and truly understand the global scale of this massive problem. 21 million people, that's the entire population of New York City, plus Los Angeles, plus Chicago, plus Houston, plus Philadelphia, plus Phoenix, plus San Antonio. In other words, the seven largest U.S. cities combined. In the news, we hear daily about the plight of refugees, migrants, along with their unacceptable living conditions. And unfortunately, even in the 21st century, we still see slavery being practiced and forced labor and prostitution. Human trafficking is not an abstract problem. It is a deeply personal one. It affects people and families and communities in every corner of the world, including here in North America. To date, 140 countries have criminalized labor and sex trafficking since, since the year 2000. And while this is an important step in the right direction, we all recognize that much, much more needs to be done. So our goal is to try to have some impact on the dialogue and the policies related to human rights. We hope to utilize this series as a platform to elevate the conversation and raise greater awareness around ending human trafficking. So very often we speak about human rights, we get stuck in just the talking about the atrocities. This evening our panel will also speak about solutions and policy changes in, needed in California and elsewhere. And we are privileged to have a very distinguished panel whose tremendous efforts and dedication contributed to the passage of SB 657, the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which requires retailers and manufacturing companies with worldwide annual revenues of $100 million to report on their specific actions to eradicate slavery and human trafficking in their supply chains. This legislation supports human rights standards, advocates, advocates corporate social responsibility, and benefits consumers through heightened transparency. So given the remarkable expertise and range of experience of our panel, I look forward to a very, very insightful conversation. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Cherry Short, the Associate Dean of Global and Community Initiatives and Professor of Practice in the USC Suzanne Dwork Peck School of Social Work, Cherry is also a visiting professor at the University of Wales, Cardiff, and I happen to be her lucky husband <laughs> as well, in f full disclosure. Before coming to USC, Cherry served in Tony Blair's administration in the United, United Kingdom for over 10 years as an elected politician and as a member of the UK Race and Equality Commission. She later became the Race and Equality Commissioner for Wales, during which she oversaw all race relations and human rights issues that affected Wales, including working on the race relations laws for the National Assembly of Wales. She received the esteemed SBE honor. For those of you not British, that's the commander of the British Empire. I always tell her the only person left to command is me, but uh, <laughs> there you have it. It used to be a great empire. Uh, the UK's highest, it's actually the UK's highest uh, public service award given by Queen Elizabeth II for extensive work in race relations and human rights. 
Cherry is also known, even though she's a professor of practice, she's known for being a doer. And she has spent her working life uh, fighting for equality and social justice. She's an experienced advocate on social justice and the criminal justice system and is a qualified social forensic social worker. I hope I got that right. Okay, so please <laughs> join me in welcoming Dr. Cherry Short. Tonight I would like to um, introduce this topic and it's one that is um, a topic that is so very painful, it's hard sometimes to express one's feeling about it. And as people that have worked in human rights, you know, we all know how serious this problem is and how difficult it is to, um, to solve or resolve in any fashion. And I think that tonight, um, for the Price School and also for me as a social worker and a forensic social worker too, that this um, way of bringing people together to let people understand that this problem isn't just an isolated thing, um, one, and secondly too, it's not just you know our panel's problem, it's everyone's problem. We are all responsible human uh, beings in this society, and therefore we are all responsible to finding solutions to actually resolve this. So, I'd like to introduce you to our panel, but before that, um, I'll, I'd like them to maybe come up on stage, or shall I introduce you first and then you walk up on stage? Maybe that's the way to do it. Seeing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> see, see, seeing Julia has done this many times. So firstly, I'd like to introduce English actress Julia Ullman. You may know her for some of her film roles, such as Legends of the Fall, Sabrina, or her Emmy Award winning performance in Temple Grandin. While Julia is also known for her human rights effort, She's the founder and president of the Alliance. And this Alliance, you'll see on your, um, your chairs um, that there is um, a leaflet there that actually states exactly what the Alliance does. And this Alliance is to work towards stopping slavery and ending trafficking. And it's called ASSET. And was Julia was also... Um, given um, this very prestige um, job, I, I, I would say, even though it's a very hard one, in a goodwill ambassador to combat trafficking and slavery. Julia has also appeared as an expert witnesses before US Congress and the United Nations for her advocate work in human trafficking. She has received the Crystal Award and the Peace Award for her amazing work in these issues. And we are so wonderful and happy to have her here tonight. Please, Julia, join me on the podium. Thank you. <laughs> the next person that I'd like to introduce is Floor. Um, Melina, we're so pleased to have her here tonight with us. She's a survivor of trafficking and is kind enough to share her story with us today. She's the founding member of CAS, Survivor Advisory Caucus, which is an organization that helps to empower victims of trafficking. Flora works to provide services and create policies that help people who are powerless in this situation. She has testified for the two bills, which Dean not mention, which is the AB 22, the California Trafficking Victim Protection Act, and SB 657, the California Transparency in Supply Chain Act of 2010. So again, we're so wonderfully lucky to have Flora to actually tell us something about what people actually suffer under these circumstances. So can we give her a warm hand of applause? Thank you. And then the next person, but last but not least, 
We have Luis de Barca with us today. Luis is the director of the State Department Office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons under President Obama's um, um, presidency. He has investigated and prosecuted many cases involving human trafficking and is the director of the Department of Justice, SMART, Office of Sex Offending Sentencing, Monitoring, Apprehending, Registering, and Checking. So please, again, welcome Louis. Thank you. Before I join them, I just wanted to set the stage once more. This is a widespread contemporary exploitation of men, women, and children. And of course, we know that is unacceptable. I'm sure everyone in this room would agree Human trafficking is indeed an epidemic. That is a blight on our society. We are here today to learn about the solutions and what every one of us here today can do to make a difference. Thank Why you. do you think that human tra trafficking is so prevalent in this society? I mean, it's one of those questions that I think that there must be something that stir inside of us when we think about it. So, somebody wants to start with that? Um, well, our perspective is to, is to work on supply chains. So, I think people who to tackle different forms of trafficking may come up with a different answer. Um, our approach has very much been supply chains, and, and I would say it's as lousy an answer as habit historical habit and belief that when we made it illegal, we got rid of it instead of doing the work. Um, and much like prohibition, it just went underground and festered and got worse. Um, disbelief that we can solve what's known as the oldest issue in the world, disbelief that that will ever really end once we do know about it and feeling overwhelmed. Um, and then that leads to denial. Um, and I think that for me, the simplest way I could put it in terms of forced labor and supply chain is slavery of old was, I think everybody would agree, an aberration of the way that we trade. Slavery today is an aberration of how we trade. Right. In effect, why do you think that, you know, that we've moved over the centuries, surely, and yet we're in a different state of um, understanding society, and still we have modern day slavery. Why do you think humans have to do this to other people, to, to people who are so similar to themselves? It's very hard to actually understand that, and I'm sure people here tonight would like to know why people behave in this way. Why do they want to sell other people? Why do they want to treat them so badly and poorly? Why? The first and longest standing non-governmental organization that continues to this day is Anti-Slavery International that goes back to the days of William Wilberforce. And yet 200 years later, we continue to have this problem. I think that there's a couple of things. First of all, thinking definitionally. What we're talking about is a violation of the international law of slavery, it's a Jus Cogens international law norm, specifically not to hold somebody in involuntary servitude. But I think one of the reasons why it survives, there are all of the cruelties and the perceived market advantage of using that cruelty um, that a trafficker may end up having. So at the end of the day, there's the personal, there's the unscrupulous employer or the unscrupulous recruiter that realizes that they can profit from that misery um, of the bait and switch um, of you know what you think you're going to get as opposed to what you do get. Or even somebody who knew that they were going to do that particular type of job, somebody who was a farm worker back home or was a prostitute back home um, or who has maybe never even left their place of origin, but they get trapped in this involuntary servitude. But I think that the big structural thing goes to Julia's point, which is that having abolished this legally 
and having changed it so our economies are not based on this. There's residual effects of chattel slavery, but slavery does not make up more than 50% of the American economy the way that it used to. I've, I would argue that slavery made up more like 80% because everybody in the North who felt that they were absolved from responsibility by not owning slaves were making a lot of money by selling people things around slavery and profiting from slavery. That's not the case anymore. Slavery is illegal. And I think that that is something that we have to take into account when we're looking at what the policy structures are um, and how far we've come over the last 200 years. But I think that Wilberforce's um, words, the first time that he introduced an anti-slavery bill in Parliament, and I think got exactly one vote for it, which was his own vote, um, starting a 40-year attempt to abolish the slave trade, um, he closed by saying, now that you know, now that you've heard what I've had to say, you will no longer be able to say you didn't know. You might be able to say you don't care. And I think that's where we are right now, is now it seems so prevalent because I think a lot of people are starting to accept the fact, to know, and people are starting to care. And so that's kind of, I think, what all of us on the stage have done is to try to, to help channel that, to, to make people more aware, but then also to hold their feet to the fire so that they don't just subsume it into a bunch of comfortable euphemisms or different policy approaches that let them not be as uncomfortable as you should get when you think about the fact that slavery still exists. Yes, I think also, before we bring um, Flora in, I think that the, the other thing that is worrisome, and I don't know if the audience feel quite worried about this too, is the fact that surely, you know, with laws that you're mentioning and people caring, that this would um, start not to be happening in the way it's happening con consistently throughout the world and globally. That's why um, Julia has been so proactive traveling um, across the world, um, looking at ways that um, she can actually work with, with, her, um, with her organization to actually change some of these practices. So the, the question I still have, if we have, um, I think it's 144 countries that have stated that, um, that they will actually criminalize slavery. Am I correct on that? Right. So why, why do we still have so many people in this situation? And maybe we can ask Flora to, to say this, um, because she's actually been one of the survivors in relation to this. In my opinion and experience, I think it is so prevalent because um, it's so hidden on plain sight. And for me, from my experience as a survivor, I think it's called to action. What are we doing as a society in our homes? Do we care about um, the suffering of our neighbor? Do, what are we doing as consumers? We all are part of the solution. And this is so prevalent as any other a crime, as any other abuse, because we are not denouncing. We are not saying this is happening right here. So as consumers, as mothers, as neighbors, what are we doing? It's actually a call to action. We can all be a part of the solution. If we see something that is not normal, we see something out of the ordinary. What are we going to do with that? Um, with that, I don't mean I'm not saying you go and risk your life. No, because we know traffickers are armed, are dangerous, and they are not going to risk their lives. They take action. So if we see something that is not ordinary, it's something that doesn't seem to be right. Tell somebody, tell law enforcement, tell a nurse, tell a teacher, but don't stay quiet. Say something, take the action. One of the things that, that flows from Flor's suggestion that if we see this, that we have to actually step up and do something, 
is from a kind of a policy approach, the way that we have dealt with this throughout the years has been very much driven by the institutions that then are brought into play. And so UNICEF will see this as a child trafficking problem. U UNODC, the Office of Drugs and Crime, will see this as a transnational organized crime problem because that is their remit. The folks in the human rights uh, world will see this as either a forced labor problem or a uh, violation of certain international law norms. The trafficking people uh, want to look at the 3P paradigm of the Palermo Protocol, which says prevention, protection, and prosecution, um, which isn't always something that the human rights folks are comfortable with because the idea of harnessing prosecutors to actually go out and vindicate the human rights um, in a lot of societies, police and prosecutors are not there to protect and serve. They're there to violate people's rights um, in practice. Um, and so from a policy perspective, you step right into a mass of self-protective silos, um, each of whom see this problem through their own lens. And then they have to confront what Floor suggests, which is actually dealing with an escaped victim or dealing with a survivor or an advocate who's coming forward. And frankly, a lot of countries do it badly, and even the United States does this badly, because all of your training as a law enforcement or as a policymaker is to divert back to all of those things you've been taught. So Singapore, for instance, will say, oh, well, those maids just don't know how to clean the windows, and they're falling out. And so we're going to have a pamphlet that says, here's how you clean the windows, as opposed to listening to the advocates in the Indonesian and Filipino communities that are saying, those maids are jumping out of the windows to try to escape. But the Singaporeans are able to say, well, we're going to look at this as a migration problem, or we're going to look at this as a anything but slavery problem, because slavery is so emotive that we'll run away. Mm -hmm. This is the only issue that I can think of that terms like rape as a weapon of war are more comfortable euphemisms than slavery. And because they're comfortable euphemisms, you see all of those structures mm -hmm. that get put out into the UN system, that get put out into the governments, that get put out into policy schools, that get put out into responses. Mm -hmm. Those structures are not the lives of the people that Floor works with at CAST or the people who I've found uh, who've trusted us with their stories. Mm -hmm. We have to really interrogate those structures so that we don't keep trying to shoehorn real people's lives mm -hmm. and re real people's suffering mm -hmm. into those structures and then deflate the entire response. Right. We'll come back to that again, because I think that issue is an incredible potent one and one that um, holds a lot of um, key to what we're discussing. But I'd like to ask Julia, um, why did she, um, from being, um, I'm sure everybody would like to know, why after um, being such an actress um, and um, being in the theater, in films, on stage, um, you know, people um, thinking so highly of you continually for the work that you do, um, being an actress, why did you decide this is something that you wanted to focus your time and effort and energy on. When you could have done something else, you could have go to um, Rodeo Drive and have a good time and um, buy the latest <laughs> buy the latest handbag and you know hang out and have coffee and drink martinis. But no, you decided to do this. So why? Oh my God. Um, well, I think one of the privileges for me as an actor has been access that is afforded to you, to um, different people, access maybe sort of media attention that you can kind of go, not really go over there to an important issue, and you can kind of change 
people's focus or say thank you know thank you but there's something perhaps that would have social good and benefit and and I think initially it was fairly I think like most people it was fairly random it was a little bit of volunteerism here it was oh well we'll attach it to this event something from Sarajevo there but I found myself being more and more drawn to it and had had two different experiences of documentary filmmaking that led to a legislative action that was substantive, um, and the formation of a uh, co-founding or co-founding chair of, being, of using film to take film out to refugee camps. And out of that came the Goodwill Ambassador role. And I have to say that when I was asked to, to, to consider the role, I said, absolutely no way, because it was, I'm sorry, so, it was so sad to me as an issue, and it felt like this was a government role, this was police enforcement, I cannot, I mean, I will support it, but I'm not gonna spend substantive amounts of my life doing something that is just sad, and I cannot connect with the solutions. I'm, I'm just trying to su sort of support government resources being put to it. And I got told to get over myself and get out there and look at, go and look for it because it's perhaps more connected to you than you think. And I used to believe that I came from a, I used to believe that I was in this very privileged position, um, that I was living in a, in a country that respected human rights and that I was free. There were awful things going on around the world, but I hadn't actually caused them. You know, maybe some of my ancestors had done some pretty awful things, um, but I hadn't actually caused it. But when I got to the trips and I met with children who were in child slavery and fishing in Lake Volta, and I heard their stories and how, you know, locals had become aware of the issue and taken action because of the numbers of children's bodies that they'd seen drown, uh, washed up on the shores, and you meet with these kids who've watched their friends drown, who've been beaten and abused and are coming out of it, this uneasy question surfaced for me. Have I, where does this fish get sold? What's the market that it goes to? Have I ever eaten this fish? Have I ever paid for this? Have I ever used it to feed my child? And it made my skin crawl because I couldn't find out. And then that was supported by subsequent trips, trips, whether it was mining, whether it was coffee, whether it was carpets, whether it was clothing. And it completely shot the myth of my freedom. So we focus on a legislative solution of transparency because we have a system that has economically enabled this to be hidden. Forced labor and supply chains is something that happens on a farm or in a factory or in a mine. You may not just walk onto those places, find the person and pull them out. It's, in, it's an internal problem. Um, and, and it's an illegal problem, just as you have shoplifting that, go, that is criminal activity that happens on a shop, so you have it at the other end of the supply chain and vulnerability. But I, I, one more thing, I think that there is an element of this, not all of it, I'm stealing your phone to make a point, um, that's about people having a stress reaction. And I think when people are really stressed, stressed to the point of having to move and face mass migration, stressed to the point of, I don't have an alternative, so the only thing left for me is self-commodification or turning to crime. The only thing I have left as a 12-year-old when the foster systems let me down is to, is to turn to survival sex. Meeting with mothers who've had four children and consciously sold one to feed the other three, I'm in no position to judge her. And it's an honor that somebody would share such a shaming story. We have, we, all of us are connected to the shame. And I think that moment when I realized as a mother, nothing is more precious to me than my child. I don't want to be harming, but I don't want to be having a life that puts other kids around the world at risk. And I think, you know, one way, one example that we give is pretty much most of us have a phone. If you're a parent, it's likely that your kid is on your screensaver. If you heard from a doctor that your kid in three weeks' time is going to die without a heart transplant, and you know what I know about 
the ability in today's criminal markets to purchase a child for $300 and that there is the existence. I need legislation to stop me from having a response as a mammal versus expecting me to be the best version of myself on behalf of society. That's why we need law. And I think there is, you know, if we look at the social sciences, they tell us that we're lousy in the face of authority. We're awful. If you look at Milgram's work on whether or not we'd electrocute somebody, if you look at behavioral economics and the work of Dan Ariely, we all lie, we all justify. Um, and I, th I think that you know, bringing all of these things together and understanding that we need to be held to account, transparency is literally us watching business corporate best practices. Thank you. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> well, it is indeed a struggle. Before I come to Flora, I wanted to ask Louis another question. Um, do you think that, well, on what Julia is actually saying, law makes a difference? Okay, but um, I wonder if, you know, if, if people aren't using the law as a, to ensure a deterrent happens, um, and they just keep breaking the law, and people in general, okay, it's going on in your neighborhood, it's going on, you know, across the world, you see it, but you don't say anything, um, how would that change? How can that become the solution? Just, just explain that a little bit to me. I think one of the things that struck me after a, a career as a prosecutor doing these cases um, and trying to put myself, um, I guess for lack of a better word, out of business, um, was that at the beginning of my time working on these cases as a young prosecutor in the Civil Rights Division, I was made the involuntary servitude and slavery coordinator, um, largely because I was the one person in the office that was doing involuntary servitude and slavery cases. So I was kind of coordinating myself, um, as, <laughs> as it were. Um, and by the time we were done, we ended up having a dedicated unit of folks who could learn the techniques that we'd uh, been able to develop. We had new law here in the US. We had a new um, paradigm for the world as far as the uh, United Nations, the Palermo Protocol, um, and then have driven out um, laws into these 140 plus countries. And that's just modern slavery laws. Um, there's pre-existing laws that are out there. And there's two things that I, that I take from, from that. First of all, which is there are a number of countries in which unless the trafficker is walking through the law library on the day of the earthquake and the book that has the trafficking law falls off of the shelf and hits, hits them, words on a page are not going to stop traffickers. Mm -hmm. It takes a person, whether it's a cop, whether it's a prosecutor, hopefully a policymaker who's willing to work with the non-governmental organizations, who's willing to work with the church, who's willing to give up a little bit of their power. And that, of course, is makes you very popular when you go to law enforcement. There's a certain, perhaps, personality that sometimes ends up in law enforcement, especially in countries around the world where law enforcement was set up to maintain social order. That kind of autocratic law enforcement um, ideal and what everybody is trained to do then has to adjust itself to Let's work in a multi-sectoral way where we're bringing in non-governmental organizations and we're empowering survivors to be part of the investigation. That's really the only way to do these cases, and yet we're asking a number of police forces around the world to do something that is anathema to what they were set up for. And I'm not just talking about you know, kind of dictatorships or anything like that. I'm talking about many of the Commonwealth countries uh, who were set up kind of like Malaysia, um, were set up with the Official Secrets Act uh, and other very heavy-handed ways of, of doing kind of colonial law enforcement. So I think that's one of the, the big impediments. And then finally, the other uh, part is the idea that how representative the law ends up being. 
if you pass a Modern Slavery Act or if you pass a Human Trafficking Act, but you then allow everybody to just, just keep doing what they're doing. Um, the UK is a perfect example. They were a signatory to Palermo very early on. And they took the position, we're fine, we're British, we have, sorry, I should stop right there. No. And, and, said, and they would say something that was very true and yet showed that they didn't really understand what it was that we were trying to do with Palermo. They said, we've got that wonderful White Slave Trafficking Act of 1882, and if there's anybody that wants to move uh, one of those Russian girls in here for prostitution, then we will use that. And we abolished slavery under well before, so we're fine. Thank you very much. Um, and we kept saying, people are being enslaved as domestic servants right here in London. Um, people uh, are being enslaved in prostitution uh, in Manchester. There's a huge uh, a case just a few years ago where the police had just ignored all of these young women who were escaping and coming and trying to get help. Um, and but they said correctly, oh, well, we've got a perfectly good anti-trafficking regime that dates back to the 1880s. And it wasn't until the tide came in, a bunch of folks, Chinese immigrants, who were, who were the term in English, English is picking cockles. They were gathering uh, little clams um, on a tidal flat. And the tide came in. And people were actually calling home, calling back to China on their cell phones as the tide came up to say goodbye to their loved ones because they knew that they were going to die. And 19 people ended up dying uh, out on those flats. And it was only after that that the UK passed its first updating of its slavery laws in 150 years, the 2009 Coroner's Act, which made it illegal to enslave someone in Britain. Before that, it was illegal to move someone into the country for prostitution, but it wasn't illegal under the criminal law to enslave somebody. And I think that that's the, the problem that we have is that even kind of liberal democracies that care about human rights often need that tragedy. The sacrifice of those cockle pickers has then allowed the UK to do cases, much as the sacrifice of 72 men and women who were handcuffed to their sewing machines in El Monte back in the 90s. And if it hadn't been for the El Monte case having the same effect on the, on the United States mm. that the cockle picker case later had on the UK, mm. we wouldn't have a Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We wouldn't have funding for, traf for trafficking organizations. When survivors came forward, we would have simply mistaken them for something else. Mm. And unfortunately, that's what it seems like it takes. It takes something horrible. So the law can be in the books. There can be a structure. And yet, it seems as though it takes a huge tragedy. And one of the things that I think all of us have worked uh, to try to accomplish is how do we raise people's hackles on this so that it doesn't take 19 people drowning to get them to do something? Because one person enslaved in a garment factory here, or one person enslaved in prostitution here, is as much of a tragedy as those 19 people. So we have a challenge, I think, for ourselves as to how do we convey that, uh, and how do we get people good and mad? And I think the, the point is that I think that you're all making is that, you know, um, people's lives are precious. But often, unless it actually touches other people to make them aware of what the tragedies are, then it's very unlikely that they will do anything to actually change it. And the point I made before that, you know, when you see something, it's sometimes when things don't touch you personally. I mean, as a social worker um, and as a forensic social worker and listening to Jack and social policy continually, I think that what comes to mind to me, um, how important policies, social policies, and the law is, and how important it is to put those right things on the statutory books, how important it is for society in general to know about them. And I think 
that's another, that's a crucial and important thing. And you're right to raise those issues. You're very right to say that, you know, I don't really want to admit that Britain was so awful, but the truth of the matter is that's exactly what happened. And it wasn't, it wasn't easily done. People just kept denying it. And I think that's what people tend to do because it's so awful that you can't really get your mind around it to think that this could be happening and you're letting it happen. So I, I totally understand that. I wanted to go back to Flora, though, as, as a person of social change and as a person who's empowered to actually do something after something so awful has happened to, to you. Um, would you share some of your, just share that story with, um, with us here tonight? I think that it will put things in context for people to understand that it's not removed from our lives. It's not something that is happening in another world. It's actually happening here among us. And it's happening all the time and therefore it's really, truly important to be diligent and not turn your back on what's currently occurring. So please, tell us your story. First of all, before I start, how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Very important. What if we give you five minutes to tell your story? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Flor Molina, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story. Um, I was contacted in my hometown in Puebla, Mexico, by my sewing teacher. Um, my sewing teacher was contacted by a trafficker from Los Angeles, and uh, she came to my house and invited me with this great opportunity to come to the United States. She said I didn't have to worry about uh, paying everything. Everything was going to be paid for. And it was a difficult decision to make, but I was a desperate mother who had just lost my youngest baby. I didn't have money to take her to a better hospital, and she passed away. When my baby passed away, this experience changed my whole life. I was working two jobs, cleaning houses and uh, cooking at a restaurant, but what I was making, it wasn't enough to feed my three children. When the opportunity came to my door, I thought, why not to take this opportunity? Because people who come to this country and go back, they never tell how difficult it is to start in this country. And based on the stories that people have told me, I thought I'm going to the United States, I'm going for six months, I needed 50,000 pesos, which was about $5,000. Um, I had my project to start my own business, and I had written a letter to the governor in my state, and uh, he was willing to support my project, which, which was to start my own business as a wind business. Because the majority of women in my village know how to sew, but there are no places where they can work. And taking in consideration that a lot of women were in the same situation as I was, I thought, I'm, I want to offer them a job. But the governor said he was willing to support my project, but I needed to have half of the money, 50,000 pesos, and the place where to start my, my project. So when the great opportunity came to my door, I said, I'm going to the United States for six months. I'm going to save this money and go back to my children. I didn't, I didn't know these people, but I knew one person, my sewing teacher, and she was coming uh, with me. She told me if I knew that more women wanted to come to the United States, I was supposed to tell them. And it was the ending of 2001. Um, in Mexico, we have huge celebration about um, Christmas and New Year, so not a lot of people wanted to leave the town. I took, I took the opportunity, and everything so, seemed to be right. They asked me for my birth certificate, they asked me for my Mexican ID, because they said they were going to make the arrangements for the trip. From my hometown to Mexico City, I traveled by car, and in Mexico City, for the first time, I took a, a flight. Um, I flew from Mexico City to Tijuana. In Tijuana is where I met my trafficker, and I haven't ever been that far from my hometown 
the farthest um, place I have been is Mexico City. So I didn't know where I was. Uh, even though we were in Tijuana, I didn't know I was in Tijuana. There I met my trafficker. My trafficker wasn't a nice person. The moment I met her, um, she didn't seem to be a nice person. She, she wouldn't talk to me. She wouldn't turn to talk to me. She just talked to her crew, her niece, and my sewing teacher. So it, this way it worked. And my trafficker talked to her niece. Her niece would talk to my sewing teacher. And then my sewing teacher would tell me what they were saying. And the moment I made my, made my trafficker, she asked me for my documents, which I didn't have them with me. They were with her niece. And she said for my safety, my safety, it was better that she kept my documents. I thought it was weird, but she's been in this country, you know, her whole life. I didn't know anything about the culture in this country. And I thought I was already in the United States, but later on, the, um, she introduced me to a coyote, a smuggler, a person who helped me to cross the border. Um, the coyote, I always say this because it's important, the coyote was nice, was a nice person, helped me to cross the border. And here in Los Angeles, I met my trafficker again. She didn't tell me about my rights or how many hours I was going to work or anything. The first thing she told me is that I am not supposed to talk to strangers. I'm not supposed to talk to anybody. Um, she know where my children were. She know where my, uh, my mother was. And now that I'm here in the, in the United States, I'm supposed to work for her. And that I owed her almost $3,000 for bringing me over. Now this is her time. And now I'm here in the US and I must comply with all her rules. The following day that I arrived, early in the morning, uh, she took me to the factory, showed me my, my chores, uh, and again, I'm not supposed to talk to the other workers who would come on regular business hours. Uh, she showed me what my chores were, remind me that I owed her so much money, and now that I'm supposed to work for her. And I thought, I'm in a new country, I don't know anybody, the only person I knew was my sewing teacher who was there with me in the situation. And um, I didn't want to do anything to angry my boss because now it's my boss and I wanted to please my boss. The first three days I went to her house to sleep and after the three days um, my trafficker and her crew, because she had a crew of eight women who monitored my movements during the daytime and at nighttime was her niece who make sure I didn't try to escape. Because she said that um, I was like a white horse, that it wasn't easy to thin me. Um, after the three days, they decided that I was supposed to sleep in the factory because the time I was using going to her house and coming back to the factory, I was wasting her time. Um, she always remind me that um, in this country, um, police would not believe me because I was illegally here. I didn't have um, any identification with me, and if anything would happen to me, the police would not care about me. She said that in this country, even dogs have more rights than I did. Because I was here illegally, nobody knew where I was, and nobody would care. And if I did anything to make her angry, uh, my children and my mother will pay the consequences. Um, I worked 17 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week, no days off. I wasn't allowed to put one step out of the factory. There was a um, little glass door that had an alarm. There were bars that they would um, lock them after the workers left. I had to clean the entire factory. My chores were multiple from sewing early in the morning. I wasn't allowed to turn on the lights because outsiders could see inside the factory. So I had to sew only with a, a little machine that is, uh, with the little light that is in the sewing machine. And at eight in the morning when the workers came, I was allowed to go to the other side and I was allowed to turn, to turn the lights on. Um, I was not allowed to talk to my coworkers or you know, walk outside to the patio area or anything like that. And she said, if I did anything to make her angry, my children will pay the consequences. And if I try to go to the police, uh, the police will not believe me. Instead, they will put me in jail. I was so scared all the time. And uh, I was sick 
because I worked long hours, I didn't have um, breaks. Uh, I had only 10 minutes to eat during the 17, 18 hours, so I was really sick. I got anemia, I got anemic. And um, one day I got sick, I got fever, and I asked her to let me go to a doctor. She said no. I didn't have any money to pay for the doctor. And I said, but my health is more important, and she said no. Instead, I got punished. She didn't let me go to see a doctor. One of my coworkers brought me some medicine, and that worked. And um, I was really, really scared. I, was, I believed that anything could happen to me, that one day I would die there. But uh, I remember when I came uh, that I had promised God, if I make it alive to the United States, first thing I would do is to thank God in a temple. So all these days have passed, and I haven't um, accomplished my promise to God. So I started asking her to let me go to a church. She said, no, why, why, why do you want to go to a church? You are, you are a bad person. And I said, that's why. I want to ask God to change my heart. And I was surprised because um, her niece was supposed to go with me to, to the church, but she said no, she decided to stay in the factory. So that Sunday when I finally got my freedom, I walked out of the factory. When I was walking through the parking lot, I realized that I was free. I had a phone number of one of my coworkers who suspected that something was wrong because she saw me that I was scared all the time that I didn't speak, and um, she gave me her phone number secretly. So when I got to the corner of that place, I tried to make a phone call. There was a public phone, but the, oper uh, the operator answered in English. I didn't know one word in English, and I didn't have any coins with me. Um, I was standing there because it was Sunday in the morning. The place where I was, the majority of the residents are uh, um, Caucasian. Not a lot of Hispanic population. I was there debating what to do. Then I saw a walking person passing by, and I asked him if he spoke Spanish. He said, yes, what's wrong with you? Because I was so scared. And then I asked him to dial the number. Um, he helped me to dial the number. My coworker came, picked me up from there, and I didn't go back. I thought I was free, and I was so happy. But then staying at my co-worker's house, uh, she came and told me to look for another place because my trafficker was forcing her to tell her where I was. And the way she found it, she found out that uh, my, my co-worker helped me was when she gave me her phone number. She came and asked, are you alone? And I didn't answer. I just signaled that somebody was hidden in the dresses. So um, my trafficker, was forcing my coworker and threatening her and her, uh, her children's life. So I had to look for another, another place where to go. I went to San Diego, staying in San Diego. A few days after I was there, uh, FBI agents came because they were already investigating the case. Thanks to a good Samaritan who had tipped um, a community-based organization, the Coalition for Humane Immigrants Rights of Los Angeles, CHIRLA. And then Chirla had tipped authorities, and authorities had sent um, FBI agents to investigate the case. Um, but since this was at the early 2002, the Trafficking Protection Act was passed in, just, in year 2000. It was a new law. Law enforcement wasn't really familiar with um, the Trafficking Protection Act. So my trafficker got a light sentence, only six months of house arrest was a judge as an abuser employer. And uh, after she finished her house arrest, she went to Mexi Mexico, visited my mother and my children, tried to figure out where I was. And of course, she tried to bribe my mother. She gave, um, my trafficker gave $20 to my mother for my mother to call her when my mother found out where I was. Um, since that time, the last time I heard that she was looking for me was in year 2008. All this time, she tried to punish me because I spoke out. And she had been doing this for more than 20 years. And she was able to save a lot of money because she didn't pay workers right. And nobody knew that was human trafficking. After I escaped and after I found um, FBI and FBI started investigating the case, um, 
I'm not happy to say that um, FBI and law enforcement, they just wanted to build a case, but they didn't care about me as a human being. They didn't ask me if I have a place where to live, uh, if I have uh, food to, to eat. I have only the clothes I had uh, when, I, when I escaped. But uh, thanks to um, organizations like Chirla and CAST, I was able to get back to my feet because when I met CAST, CAST helped me to find a shelter, helped me to make the first doctor's appointment, helped me to enroll in English classes. So um, after getting back to my feet and recovering from the trauma, I decided to start speaking out about the issue because what happened to me, it shouldn't happen to anybody else. And um, my trafficker took advantage because I was so vulnerable. I needed um, to save my, my other three children. And I think it's something that um, the only way to fight back is speaking about the issue and doing something. And I remember when I was in, the, in my situation, I was putting label onto dresses because we made party dresses that were being sold in department stores, big department stores, and I don't want to mention them. But um, I remember that those uh, dresses were being sold for $200, and I didn't get paid. So that's why I thought we all can be a part of the solution. And we can all, as consumers, can demand justice and a supply chain transparency. And um, when we had the opportunity, Julia and I, to, uh, to go and lobby for um, SB657, um, I think um, by passing laws, we can at least do an effort to end the demand and to eradicate um, human trafficking. And human trafficking is, I, I always say, is like, like a monster with so many different heads. And that's why it's so hard to eradicate. But if we do something, one survivor at a time, we can save them. And I always remember this phrase that I read on Facebook. It says that, um, like a starfish, you cannot save all of them, but if you say one, you make a difference in that starfish. And it's the same with human trafficking. If you, you help one survivor, you are making a difference in one person's life. So thank you very much for coming. And oh, I, I just want to add one more thing, um, that I have been so privileged uh, as a survivor, and I became an advocate, that when I was in the situation, I had no face, I, I had no voice. And now, as a survivor and advocate, in year 2015, 11 members, we were nominated by President Obama. And he's the, um, and as a result of the um, Survivors um, Trafficking Act of year 2015, um, he selected 11 members from around the country 11 advocates and um, survivors uh, to advise the White House to combat human trafficking. So I'm a member of the US Advisory Council at the White House among other 10 members. And to me, I always say this is huge because when I was in the situation, nobody knew about human trafficking. It was a new law. I mean, lawmakers were working to bring a relief to survivors, but it was a new law, and law enforcement wasn't aware of this tremendous um, crime. And now we are at the White House advising the White House, the TIP office, to implement better services for victims. So I think we have come a long way, and um, all of us together, we can make the difference, and we can eradicate human trafficking. Thank you very much for coming tonight. You know, it's really um, difficult, I would think, to share bitter and awful experiences. Um, but uh, especially when people have gone through dramatic times in their lives. And so, you know, to sit here and actually be able to relay that story and to go elsewhere and state it takes a great deal of courage. And sometimes I don't think people recognize that. They just think, you know, because it doesn't touch us. But to actually 
tell your story when you've been treated so poorly. Can you imagine how you feel? So we thank you. And we thank you for sharing that experience because it actually opens our thinking um, for us to understand this isn't somewhere else. This happened in California, okay? This isn't in some third world country. This is actually in our backyard. Um, and so it's really important that we are aware of these issues. And like Louis was saying, I mean, the important thing is that if we're aware that there's an act, if we're aware that there's things you can actually do, and Julia's out also saying regarding the solution, there's things we can actually do to turn our thinking towards that, then, you know, we're not just not doing anything. I mean, it's, e it's such a big problem that it's often easy to say it's not my problem. But it could be your daughter, it could be your next door neighbor. You know, it's all our problems. So we want to go away thinking about that tonight. There's been a lot of media focus on uh, refugee boats that are going down in the Mediterranean, uh, some of them filled with sub-Saharan uh, migrants. Um, but very little attention is being paid to the fact that a lot of people are not even getting to those boats where they're possibly drowning, uh, but being enslaved in uh, um, intermittent countries like Libya. And uh, I've read articles that said for a few years it was being concealed and uh, the, the human transactions were being made kind of quietly underground and that the Libyans have become so confident that nobody's going to do anything about it, uh, that uh, the slaves are being sold in the, in the open market. Um, are, um, could you um, talk a little bit more about that if you know about the subject, and perhaps tell me if there are any other uh, uh, North African countries that are participating in the same trade? I think that one of the things that we reported on, uh, every, so every year in, in the, as part of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000, the State Department's trafficking office, which you've heard was uh, talked about as the TIP office, trafficking in persons uh, office, uh, does a report on what is the situation in each country in the world and what they're doing about it um, through the lens of the three Ps of prevention, protection, and prosecution. Um, and my office was responsible for that, um, and I helped put that together and negotiated it uh, while I was ambassador. And so we were wrestling with this issue even before the kind of destabilization of North Africa during the Arab Spring um, and the kind of implosion um, of Libya. Um, and this has been a problem in the region. It's been a, a problem uh, not just in Libya, um, but very much so um, in Algeria, perhaps even more of a problem in Algeria than in Libya. Um, but the Algerians, um, I think, have been much better, as, as you said, hiding it. I'm not a diplomat anymore. For, in, I think we're in day 89 or 90 of me not uh, being a diplomat, uh, so I'm going to say undiplomatic things, um, <laughs> if I might. Um, one of the biggest problems um, is that the utter collapse of, of any governing structures in Libya um, have uh, resulted in just a, an openness and a brazenness, as you said. Um, as far as the alien smuggling is concerned, they're literally getting 13 miles offshore um, jumping out to a chase uh, boat and pulling the scuppers um, so that the migrants will start to drown and then have to be rescued uh, by the Italian Coast Guard. Um, so they're not even putting enough gas in to get up to Lampedusa um, or to Italy like they used to. They're literally just going straight out towards the, the screening boats, uh, knowing that those people will get rescued. The concern that, that I have and the concern that, that we were uh, raising uh, in the report and that we were raising diplomatically um, is not simply with the frontline um, Mediterranean countries, um, but other countries in the, in the Sahel uh, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where many of which are countries in which slavery has only been illegal for about 10 years. 
like Mauritania, Mali, you know, et cetera. And when you say slavery's been illegal, we don't mean they've only just now done a human trafficking law. We mean multi-generational chattel slavery only now being uh, put into place. And so you've got a, a, a place where you've got a very well-established, never really stopped kind of Toreg south to north trade um, that's you know, kind of being replicated now with the new group of folks who are showing up willingly. They're not being kidnapped from their villages like in the old days. They're showing up willingly and kind of feeding themselves into that machine. But I think that the fact that you're one of the first kind of folks that's not in Washington in a very small group of North Africanists um, who have actually identified this, to me, I'm going to take that as, as a great sign because that means that you know, people are starting to pay attention. People are starting to, to hear about it. Then the, the question is, how do we circle back and put uh, the kind of um, put the kind of pressure that's necessary on the Tunisians, uh, the Algerians, and the Moroccans, just as we have to try to put together some kind of governing structures in Libya? I guess what I would add is that we really do live in a time when there are, we're living in the first time in history where we can stop slavery. It is complicated for us to get rid of it, but it is possible. Um, and I think that's part of it is technology. And I think part of it is how do we create solutions? How do we have all of it? I don't think, I think there are lots of separate different tracks, whether it's a prosecution track, whether it's a government involvement, whether it's legislation which in and of itself is a piece of paper, does it shift the environment that enables other people to get traction with what they want to do and create a viable market for those solutions? So um, I, I think as we look at it as a system and a, a kind of network, our stuff would intersect in terms of I think in part because of transparency as it spreads around the world and work practices we very quickly heard stories of um, child labor in Turkey from refugees falling into that. Um, I also think there's something, you know, if you look at a film like Spartacus that looks about people escaping from slavery, you've also got Africa, you've got pirates in the Mediterranean trying to get people. I mean, we, it really hasn't changed. Um, we have, and, and I think that what, I think that another big part of the problem is that we ha I mean, for me, in the room, we have probably the finest leader in the space, possibly in the world, sitting here. And to, to not kind of resource Lou, or there's only four um, appointees who are ambassadors, to not take that experience and, and make sure that it has this sure future of, conti of continuity for all of us is absurd. And... I can look back on days at starting at the UN. No, don't do. Don't go red. <laughs> you know, look all shy. Um, we're sorely lacking leaders. And, you know, there's sort of very few people that I think people trust their integrity and trust that they're bipartisan and they'll find solutions for everyone. Um, there are innovations and there are solutions. Um, and I think we have to accept incremental change it's not going to turn around overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to share, share those solutions. But if you take something like refugees, mm -hmm. we have facial recognition technology. We have fingerprinting. We have a uh, fingerprint that can open up an iPhone. We need to take all of these solutions and apply them to non-traditional places where, where perhaps you wouldn't have that. And I think I talked uh, earlier about working on refugees. Refugee reunification, when people flee in a refugee circumstance, there was no way for the UN to reunite families. So you'll sit for years in a refugee camp with no idea as to whether or not your child, your uncle, your wife survived if you were at a different point when you had to flee for years. And Microsoft and VPs of Microsoft set, set, step forward and say, we can give the UN all of the hardware, all of the software to map everybody and reunite them. And the UN, UN had to say, we can't do that because if Albanian mafia hack it, they'll have all of the information they need to traffic.
you have to have tenacity around the solutions. It's not good enough. And, and I actually believe that the, we're seeing it's a really exciting time at the same time. It's really important to have that be a takeaway as well. In terms of human trafficking, we're 100 days into the Trump administration. It's early. But are we seeing differences in the Trump administration approach on this issue compared to the Obama administration? <laughs> Good question. Um, we just sent, as of today, a letter to Trump's administration and telling them that the U.S. Advisory Council exists and we are trying, we are requesting a meeting with them. That's all I can say. <laughs> and at least um, they have brought the topic to the table. We heard that on news not too long ago, but that's all I can say. But at least we sent the letter as, you know, the U.S. Advisory Council, telling them that we exist and we are interested in having a meeting with them. I think that one of, one of the things that we've seen is that, and you have to think about it in, the, in kind of the broader context of things that have been done by the Trump administration. And so um, while there's been announcements that foreign assistance um, is going to be um, kind of in question, um, there's been um, some aggressive moves towards sanctuary cities that I think a lot of folks in the victim community are concerned will tamp down trafficking victims' willingness to come forward, et cetera. On the other hand, uh, my successor, Susan Coppedge, who's the current ambassador at large uh, for the trafficking office, um, is one of the few people who um, was asked to stay on. Um, and she is uh, in the trafficking office, certainly through the summer, when the new tra this year's trafficking report comes out. There's a bipartisan consensus um, around, I think, the trafficking office and around this new uh, legislation that has a, a new type of funding that will supplement the trafficking office uh, that Senator Corker um, was the driver of. Um, and then you've got uh, in both uh, Ivanka Trump, now in an official position, uh, semi-undefined official position, but I think growing portfolio every day. Um, and more importantly, um, the person who she brought in uh, to assist her, who's now uh, the deputy um, national security advisor uh, in Dina Powell, um, you've got folks who have publicly um, put down a marker as to how much they care about this. The proof, of course, is in the pudding, and I think that there's a lot of us uh, that are uh, wanting to be able to pitch in uh, and help. Uh, and um, I think that we need to be able to carve out a space um, so that even if there are other things that people disagree with on a policy perspective or in a political perspective uh, or what have you, um, that may affect related communities, whether it's the immigrant community or, or refugees, et cetera. Um, right now, I think a lot of us are uh, wanting to take these folks at their word um, that uh, this is something uh, that certainly uh, Dina and Ivanka and others care about and we can move forward on. So I think the jury's still out, um, but you know I think that just as with the President's Survivor Advisory Council, um, you've got a bunch of folks who are, are ready to pitch in and, and hoping that uh, we're called upon uh, to be able to do that. Thank you. We make a media regarding human trafficking, sexual assault, and gender-based violence. And, you know, there's been many, many films out about this issue, but not many of them have really moved the needle forward as far as I'm concerned and been very accurate in their portrayal of these kinds of stories. So I would love to hear from the three of you uh, what you would like to see in the evolution of media or what the forward-thinking role would be in terms of, of what you would dream of seeing uh, in television and film. A short, short, short answer. Yeah. <laughs> For me, yeah. not sensationalized. Because um, there is a lot of coverage in, on media about sex trafficking, and they always forget about labor trafficking. And I think both of them and all kinds of um, human trafficking are trafficking. So they need to be covered, and uh, media needs to be more um, responsible when reporting about um, human trafficking, not only sex. There are many different forms of human trafficking. Human trafficking is human trafficking, whether it's labor, sex, um, child, all kinds of trafficking. Thank you. Short, short, 
Um, firstly, I would say in terms of, can I just answer the legislation one Dodd-Frank and repealing, seeing regulation as just sort of something that needs to be repealed, which also has as a conflict minerals legislation. The, I also think we're sitting on an opportunity in, in California to bring legislation and knock it out of the park, whatever happens federally. Um, and I think in terms of media, I would love, I just, I know Hidden Tears, they do great stuff. Um, I think we need to also switch to media about freedom. What does freedom mean to us? We need to switch to talking about human rights. Is the, if we push human rights throughout the world and we take our, our policy through our trade in human rights, the byproduct of that is the absence of forced labor and slavery. If people had opportunities um, where, they, where they lived, um, and if we, we had transparency in the factory where you were working, she would have been found sooner, and you would have been helped sooner. Um. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I will simply refer you to the Underground Railroad Museum, um, which the little mini uh, version of 12, 12 Years a Slave, um, which they did a few years ago called Journey to Freedom, um, which basically takes Solomon Northrup's story um, and then basically looks at modern survivors and their uh, tale. And so that notion of having it very rooted in survivor narratives, just as it was not only slave narratives, but getting survivors like Frederick Douglass, et cetera, in as leaders of the, of the movement is the only way that we made slavery illegal in the first place. And so things that you know basically follow the precept of nothing about them without them, um, and really putting that at, at the heart of the, the product, what a, whatever type of film or, or art it actually is. My home country, Turkey. Turkey has got uh, lots of refugees and uh, human trafficking, especially last two, two decades. Uh, Turkish governments and authorities uh, uh, working hard, really working hard, I know them because I'm graduated from police academy. Uh, but uh, Turkey needs some help, or uh, looks like Turkey, uh, the other countries also looks like Turkey. Uh, they need some help, financial help and political help. Uh, you think uh, international institutions or the uh, uh, rich countries, developing countries, uh, help is enough, uh, like uh, Turkey or the other countries, getting more? Uh, refugees and, you know, okay. it's Be enough sure. or not. Sure. The, the number that we heard from uh, the dean earlier of $30 billion a year in profit to the traffickers, um, it could be juxtaposed with the U.S. annual spend on helping countries around the world, rich countries, poor countries, middle countries, um, about $100 million total. Um, and so, uh, if you simply look at what the traffickers are making versus what governments are spending on it, um, and the U.S. dwarfs the rest of the, the donor nations, um, at that point I think that kind of answers your question as to whether or not the, the donor nations are actually doing what they need to to be in this fight. Um, before you come up, Dean, I know the lady over here has been, and I didn't see her because my back was turned here, <laughs> so I think she has the right to actually say something. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm both a USC and UNICEF alum. I graduated from USC, worked for UNICEF for some 20 years, and now I'm so delighted to be back here. And this is just a fantastic, fantastic um, forum. And I uh, teach at CAC Children in Emergencies. Um, and um, Julia rightfully is talking about human rights. Uh, we know that there is a convention called Convention on the Rights of the Child. And the whole world has ratified this convention. Um, up to last year, there were three countries who hadn't ratified the convention. It was Somalia, South Sudan, and the United States. And um, now Somalia and South Sudan has ratified the convention. The United States is the only one. Um, who hasn't ratified the convention. And um, I don't know in the, with the present situation, how do you see that? How do you 
I mean, it's really important. It has explicit uh, items on trafficking. I can only speak for my, uh, You don't have yeah. to speak diplomatically. No, no. <laughs> I, will I can do the undiplomatic <laughs> bit for you. <laughs> well, I, I'll say something that I think is probably still the U.S. Uh, position to some degree, and that is um, that the, unfortunately, both um, Convention on the Rights of the Child and CEDAW, um, which had almost universal um, ratification pre-2000 um, were not filling the ecological anti-slavery fighting niche that was necessary that the Palermo Protocol then filled. And I think that whether or not the U.S. ratifies CEDAW, whether or not the U.S. ratifies Convention on the Rights of the Child, many, 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 many countries that we uh, worked with that were do not only doing horrible things uh, as far as their response to trafficking, but we're actually engaged in state-sponsored slavery and state-sponsored trafficking. We're very proud ratifiers and signatories to Convention on the Rights of the Child. So I think that in the Obama administration that we continued kind of the U.S. Uh, skepticism as to whether or not that particular instrument was sufficient to reach the trafficking harm that we were looking for. Um, and my undiplomatic thing, uh, is going to be that I really have no idea what's going to happen with the, the next administration, but I don't see them being more forward-leaning on those particular instruments uh, than we were in the Obama administration. It's a powerful tool say, for... Uh, I would just say that from what I know of it, and I'm not an expert of it, one of the stumbling blocks is the age at which the U.S. wishes to recruit people into the Army. Um, and that's one of their stumbling blocks. And from UN days, I would say it denies the US a leadership role, especially when it hits child soldiers. Um, I don't really see how if the US takes this stance and continues with this stance, um, they can talk to anybody about child soldiers. It's also a presidential veto. I don't know if that's something that has changed, but it is a presidential decision, not a congressional um, decision as to as to whether or not America works with countries that have child soldiers and support child soldiers. Um, and I think that's something that equally, equally could be looked at. And the out, the, dip, you know, the political out is, oh, well, we're going to work with these countries because they're giving us secrets. OK. Well, thank you. Yes, I know. I want to, uh, <laughs> thank the panel for a really great